Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Rodney Obien. I am head of special collections and archives at Keene State College in, Keene, in beautiful Keene, New Hampshire. I'll be your host tonight uh, for our second installment of Archives in Context. Uh, Archives in Context is a series of online conversations uh, about archives, preservation and culture, and celebration of Archives Month um, observed in October. So I uh, always need to um, mention our sponsors. Um, the, our sponsors of our program is Keene State College's Mason Library, the Vermont State Archives and Records Administration, and the New Hampshire State Archives. Uh, uh, now to tonight's program. It's my sincere pleasure to introduce our guest, John Levine. Uh, John is project archivist at the Vermont Jazz Center in Brattleboro, where he assists on access and preservation strategies for the center's media collections. He is also access service librarian at the School for International Training, also in Brattleboro. John has an MS in Library and Information Science from uh, Simmons University and, and an MFA in Electronic Music from uh, Mills College. He has lived and worked in Vermont for 30 years. Uh, so, um, welcome, John. Um, Thank you. Uh, and before we get started, just, just a few things, a few more things. Uh, we, we will be taking questions uh, later in the program or during the program. So please post your questions in the Q&A box. Uh, and I will read them. I will read them. You don't have to read them, John. I'll read them. Um, Thank you. In the order that they were received. And uh, also, we are recording this program, uh, and it will be available on Mason Library's uh, Facebook page. So, again, I welcome everyone. And without further further ado, let's get started. So, um, John, I think it might be best for you to, if you could give it an introduction. Um, introduction to the Vermont Jazz Center. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Thank you, Rodney. And just want to say I'm really, really honored to be here and also just really honored to be part of the Vermont Jazz Center. It's a, it's a, it's a really uh, great spot. So the Jazz Center, its history goes back to the early 70s uh, when the late founder and director jazz guitarist Attila Zoller would invite musicians from New York City to unwind and to create music at his home in Newfane, Vermont. Uh, so from those beginnings, uh, then there, they started summer workshop series and that summer workshop evolved into the Vermont Jazz Center. And then in 1997, the Vermont Jazz Center was incorporated as a 50C3 nonprofit. And in now in its current mode, it has a really interesting environment where there's concerts, workshops, um, weekly jam sessions, classes in jazz history, and ensembles and, and private lessons. Uh, so it's in the, it's located in um, Brattleboro's Cotton Mill Hill. It used to, once upon a time, it was a cotton mill and uh, then it was the Dunham Shoe Factory. And so in this complex, um, the Jazz Center has two offices. It has the main, it has the main concert, concert area. And then it has, we're, we're in right now, the archive and library room. Um, it's got this really nice loft-like space. You can't see it, but there's really high ceilings. There's those white columns that you find in classic loft areas. Um, really great. I see archival boxes too, right? There are archival boxes right there. there the so, okay, yeah, yeah. yeah okay. <laughs> um, there's also a Steinway D concert grand and uh, lighting gear and professional sound gear. So, uh, so for example, this, this, this fall, among other things, there's the Samba per Percussion Ensemble, Zoom Tunes, a Youth Jazz Ensemble, Ear Training and Theory, Latin Jazz Ensemble, uh, and Blues and Influences, uh, as well as I mentioned, the Weekly Jam Session. And there's also a summer workshop, a multi-generational summer workshop that takes place in the Putney School. And so one, one other thing I should mention is that the audiences here are really enthusiastic. So uh, before COVID, I think it it's about 250 people. And the musicians and the musicians that come are really like top shelf, um, highly professional. Um, and even if they're not people that you may, 
may not have heard of, um, the level of performance is just, it's really high. But the other thing is you get to this really cool space and um, the audience is really, is really engaged. And so it's a very special place. Um, so for example, just recently, the last concert was the Bernstein Golding, uh, Bernstein Golding uh, Stewart organ trio. And like the organ uh, player, Larry Goldings, he tours with uh, James Taylor. Um, other people recently, Emmanuel Wilkins Quartet, they were on the top of many of the 2020 best lists. So that's the kind of stuff that goes on. Um, the collections, do you have any questions? I just wanted to, yeah, I just wanted to add, just wanted to say, how did you get involved with, with this? So, um, but yeah, I, did, I interrupted you. you, oh. you uh, yeah, so. no, that's, that's fine. Um, I got involved because um, Eugene Newman, the director of the Jazz Center, got in touch with the Vermont Records, uh, Historical Records Program, um, which is run by Rachel Onuf up in Montpelier. And one of the things that Rachel does is she connects collections with archivists. And so that was how I was, how I was recruited to, to work on this project. And the current, the current collections that we have, uh, the current collections that we have, we have a, we have a book collection and the, uh, several donations. One was from one of the founders, Howard Brofsky, who was a musician, scholar, uh, performing mus musician. So we had his, his books and then the books of um, Martin Jeezer. Martin Jeezer is also, a, um, was an author essayist and was also a member of the Packers Corners uh, commune in Guilford. Uh, then there was a donation from the director Eugene. Uh, so some of his books were here. So there's a book collection. Then there's a collection of about 7,000 CDs. And the CDs were donated by Lou Cannonstein. Uh, Lou Cannonstein was a publisher who then became a record producer and he started producing, the label was called Box Holder Records. And most of the records he produced were avant-garde, free jazz, uh, but his collection that he donated, the 7,000 collections, although it is fairly deep in some experimental and avant-garde material, uh, there's also some straight ahead jazz as well. So we're in the process now of the books that you, the books that you see behind me, the books have all been, have all been cataloged in the catalog and we're in the process now of working through the through the CD collection. And that was a was a really it was a really interesting project. We started out with just the books. We started out with um, just using Tiny Cat, which is a it, there's a free service and there's a, a low uh, cost service. And we quickly realized that it, it was okay for the books, but it wasn't necessarily going to work. Uh, with the CD collection. And so we heard of a grant from the, uh, the Equinox Open Library initi Initiative uh, and they provide services for Koha, Koha which is a, an open source um, library service, um, an OPAC and an ILS. And so we applied for the grant and the first year we didn't, win, but they really recommended that we apply again. And so the second year we applied and we won. And so uh, as a result, we've been given a in, perpetu in perpetuity, um, completely hosted and completely supported instance of the Koha, OPAC and ILS. And so that's what we've been, that's what we've been able to catalog the books and what we're starting to catalog the CDs into. Uh, the other the other collections that we have as the Jazz Center has always and we'll talk about Attila Zoller in a little bit. Uh, yeah, you know, and Attila himself, he you know, the reason why you know we have his we have his tapes that have been digitized, and you know Attila was I think really into self documentation as an artist, and the Vermont Jazz Center, you know, as long as I've started seeing concerts here, um, things have always been recorded here. So for example, in the 90s, things were recorded in VHS and uh, things were recorded in VHS, they were recorded in DAT. Now everything's 
everything is born digital, as they say in the business, everything is uh, recorded, you know, to hard drive. Um, and so right now, uh, when concerts are recorded, they're recorded um, high quality video, and they're also recorded in, um, you know, multi-camera, uh, you know, it's kind of like live editing uh, as the concert takes place. So like sometimes it's three cameras um, are, you know, combined into the, into the image. Uh, that approach has really served us well during COVID because the Jazz Center was able to take that technology of being able to record the multi-camera the multi -camera recording and was able to basically flip that over to um, Facebook and Vimeo streaming so that, you know, when it wasn't possible to have an audience, it was still possible to, to have concerts. So, uh, so that's a whole nother collection. Um, it's the collection of the, of the uh, video and uh, the high quality digital video and audio collection. And when the concert, also when the concert happens, there's, an, there's a photographer who takes photographs during the course of the, of the concert. So there's also documentation in terms of um, digital photography. And then the materials like the press releases and the posters are all also digitally preserved. And um, is there, are there other, oh yeah, and there's also, there's generally a, if we're lucky, there's a, a artist interview before the concert. Um, Eugene is, uh, works at the local radio station, WVEW, and interviews the artists. Um, and then those are placed on, online as well. So that's the, that's the depth of the, of the collection that we have. So they, they brought, uh, Eugene brought you in to kind of organize and, and, and uh, create a plan for things. Um, so are you feeling overwhelmed yet? I'm feeling <laughs> overwhelmed. <a little bit. laughs> well, I have to say the thing that, the thing that, that really, it just changed everything was winning, it was, was winning the, the, the Equinox uh, Equinox Open Library initi Initiative mm -hmm. grant um, because we then, you know, we weren't exactly sure what databases to use or anything like that. And so we ended up, you know, with this cloud-based fully supported library. And, you know, the, the, the difficulty is of course that you think about an OPAC or an ILS and you think about books or you think about CDs, right? It's great for books and CDs, but it's like, well, really you're gonna, you're gonna, you're going to catalog your your archival collection in that as well and so you know it turns out that yes we're, we're gonna i started to do some research and there's a couple of uh, you know um for example the uh the walk uh, the walker art museum in in minneapolis um has a has a archive and they're actually using koha and they're cataloging their archive collection um there yeah. In, in, and so, and there are, you know, the other thing is that um, uh, Koha, like many of them, the, the entree into that is using Mark as when you, when you do data entry or when you, you add things into collection, either you import it um, automatically or you do it manually, it's all done through, through Mark. So that's been a, another um, interesting learning curve is learning how to catalog your archival collection in Mark. But do you go ahead? <laughs> oh no, go ahead. no, go ahead, go ahead. No, no, just I was asking Sue. So I think uh, we had we had talked about. Um, I guess I, I was going to talk to you a little bit about that later on about uh, Dublin Core and so forth. But you know, I, I, I know we, you know, we were talking about the difficulties of doing uh, describing things in in Mark and uh, for archival materials. Um, the, you know, the, we, we were looking at, I don't want to get too, because I still have that PowerPoint to show us. Yeah, yeah, we, we, should, we, um, should, we should get to the, um, <laughs> the Zoller collection. <laughs> this is the Zoller collection, but uh, we'll, we'll go back to talking about cataloging. We'll, we'll try to, but, um, and also I'd like you to talk a little bit about the clear, the clear grant that you received, but you don't, you know, let's, let's, let's talk about the, the Zoller collection a bit. And I know you have some music to play for us too. And, could you also talk a bit too about the 
the collaboration with the Northeast Document Conservation Center. So that, that, I know that's that's something I hear a lot of a lot about. So, um, yeah, but John, go ahead. yeah, that'd be great. So uh, when I started when I started working at the Jazz Center, uh, one of the board members is also a grant writer, and so there are always grants in the pipeline. There are always grants in the pipeline um, at the Jazz Center, and the grant writer. Um, recommended that we look at the clear recordings at risk. And so a group of us, um, the videographer and the director, myself, the grant writer, and um, another board member who's a musicologist and academic, we all got together and worked on applying to the clear grant and we won. So we were, I think there's, they, they give about, in each cycle, I think they give about 40. And so we were one of the winners and um, uh, so we picked the NEDCC as the, as the folks to do the digitization of the tapes. And, um, oh yeah, before so we- are, These are, these are, these are the Zoller tapes, right? So, yeah. Okay. So let me talk about, let's talk about a tape. Yeah, if you, if you could, why don't you, why don't you dive right into talking about uh, Zoller and, and his collection? Because I, I think it's, it's just really fascinating. Yeah, it's, so- it's, it's just one of many collections that you have, but- Certainly, um, that's the one that a lot of people hear about. Yeah, here actually, let's at this point, let's go to. So, uh, I'm going to turn off my uh, <laughs> mic and camera, not to interfere with your. Hopefully, the sound will work. Right, I've clicked. I've clicked the box for share sound, so we should be in good shape. Um, so yeah, this is the. Um, that's Attila there in the in the corner, and those are. Um, as a, can you see the PowerPoint? Rodney? Uh, yes, I can see yeah. it. Yeah, so that's Attila there in the corner. And then those are the tapes. That's actually a shot that I took of the tapes uh, in situ um, in, the, in the home where they were, where they were stored um, at the time. So Attila. Um, uh, Attila Zoller was born in Hungary in 1927. Uh, to a musical family. Uh, by 1945, he had moved to Budapest to become a professional musician. He escaped his native country just ahead of the Soviet takeover in 1948, and he made his way to Vienna. The story is apparently he took a, his guitar and a, a change of clothes and hiked over the mountains. To, uh, so then uh, after finding success in the Vienna jazz scene, he moved to West Germany in 1954. There he performed and sometimes recorded with both European and many of the touring American musicians, including bassist Oscar Pettiford and saxophonist Lee Connitz. After a brief trip to New York City in 1956, he decided to emigrate to the United States in 1959. Um, there he received a scholarship to the Lenox School of Jazz in Massachusetts, where uh, when he was there at the Lenox School of Jazz in Massachusetts, his roommates were Ornette Coleman and Don Cherry. Following that meeting, Zoller became one of the pioneers of free jazz. Um, and meanwhile, in the 60s, his career moved into high gear, performing or recording with Chico Hamilton, Benny Goodman, Herbie Mann, Steen, Stan Getz, Jimmy Rainey, Ron Carter, and Herbie Hancock, among others. Um, uh, Attila was also committed to teaching, and in 1974, as I mentioned earlier, he started running jazz clinics in Vermont, and that is what were the roots of what became the Vermont Jazz Center. Uh, an early participant of those workshops was a young Pat Metheny, um, Pat Metheny, sorry. Um, and Attila also had a technical side. Um, he created a, a pickups for guitar and bass and a pickup for the vibraphone, as well as a line of of guitar strings. So the collection is a combination of um, open reel tapes and, and cassette recordings. And it's about, I think it's about 89 of open tapes and about 53 of the cassette of the cassette tapes. And uh, the there was um, there were some preservation issues um, with some of the tapes. Um, uh, the, the, the technical terms, there were um, what's called spoking, which is when they're, they're not really 
in the reel, they're not even. Um, they had what's called stepped pack, where you can see ridges in the tapes, um, uneven tension. A lot of the tapes you see in that picture, they, they, they're just loose. Um, the ends of the tapes are loose. They don't have leader on them, so, they, so the tapes aren't uh, held down. And some of the tapes had um, what's called sticky shed syndrome. You've probably heard of baking tapes and where as a situation where you actually take the tapes and you put them in like a medical or, or a uh, scientific uh, oven uh, and you bake them at exactly the right temperature. I can't remember what it is. And that makes the, uh, that makes the recording medium um, re-adhere temporarily to the, to the tape medium so that you can digitize them. Uh, it was really amazing working with NEDCC because, well, one, because they were really had a lot of enthusiasm for the collection, but also because, because Attila was, was pretty technical, um, he used tape in a really interesting way. Uh, Attila would use, you know, all sides of the tapes. He would use the tapes combining uh, different speeds, different track configurations, so that you couldn't just throw the tape on the tape deck and play it. They all had to be attended to because the, um, you know, because the way that Attila recorded the tapes many times had rather unusual um, configuration. So it was a real, it was a, it was a real challenge for um, the technicians on occasion to, you know, to do these. Um, but the the results that have come back have been have been pretty have been have, uh, have been pretty amazing as I as I started to review them. So let's see. Um, I'm going to play just a few brief examples of things. I'm going to go through different um, time periods. So this is from 1968, and I think these may be uh, these may be. I'm not quite sure what these are, but I think these some of these might be some working tapes from when he was working on his Gypsy Cry. Uh, record, and this is one of these classic examples where you can hear people start a take. And then stopping a take and you know starting another one. It's kind of it's it's fun to it's you're like it's sort of like you are you're in the recording you're in the studio with them as they're making the recording. It's kind of like you know it's high on the wall kind of thing. Here we go. Open a take four. So the, and here's another tape. Um, this is actually recorded at uh, Maple Valley, which was used to be a a, a, a ski a ski slope out on on Route 30 on the way to New Fane. There's an interesting story about this. Um, when I started to going to um, some um, back issues of the uh, Reformer, and I found an an interview with. Um, um, Dre Hobbs, who's a guitarist. And um, let's try to see if I can find the quote here. So uh, Dre was talking about um, the 1970s and he said, uh, this article in the Reformer begins by saying, it was, it was easy for Dre Hobbs to fight through the crowds to meet the great jazz guitarist Attila Zoller for the first time because there weren't any crowds. And here's the quote from, from Dre. I introduced myself to Attila in the early 1970s, the Maple Valley Ski Lodge. 
he was playing and very few people were there. Uh, so this is a, um, and this is a, so this is the, the recording is from, um, is from Maple Valley. The other thing is, you know, if you look at, I, I've put in the, in the PowerPoint, I've put these, um, the pictures of the tapes themselves, just because these tapes kind of, the boxes themselves kind of tell a really kind of interesting story. I mean, this, this tape somehow snuck out of the NBC audio recording service and then got recycled uh, many, many times until finally it became the, this particular concert. So um, the track I'm going to play is, uh, it's one of Attila's tunes, um, the birds and the bees. So let me just cue it up here. So also in 1975, uh, Attila played quite extensively also in, in Europe and particularly in, in Germany. And so the next tape is a recording from uh, Freiburg in 1975, Attila Zoller, uh, trombonist Albert Mangelsdorf and um, percussionist Alphonse Mouzon. And this is a, this is, I find this tape interesting for, for me personally, for a lot of reasons. One, just because I myself have a, um, uh, uh, personal and academic interest in um, European free improvisation and from this particular time period, and also just the medium of tape, um, this particular box, it's just fair. I know something about this box is pretty cool. Um, but the other thing too, is that this was kind of like a surprise because the the handwriting on here, I mean, I knew that was Attila Zoller and I knew that was um, uh, Mangelsdorf, but the last name, I'm looking at it going like, is that Morton? Is it, you know, is it Morton? Is it Mouton? Uh, and it wasn't until listening to the tape, I realized it was Alphonse Mouzon who was um, active in, in, in jazz, um, R&B and fusion. Um, so anyway, this is a, um, Albert Mangelsdorf is um, European, uh, German uh, trom trombonist. And so I'll, I'll play an excerpt from, from this tape, Freiburg, uh, in 1975. Hold on while I cue this up. This is the place where the, we were talking about the space. This is the place where we have some silence and space it's in between. Uh, queuing this up. Okay, here we go. <laughs> ¶¶ 
The next one, um, I wasn't sure uh, what was going to be on this tape. Um, it, as you can see, the box only said uh, jo Joe Chambers um, Town Hall. And what it turned out to be was, um, it's recorded off the radio. Uh, it's recorded off the radio and it's um, a, 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 a uh, com composition called Movement by Joe Chambers and then the, the the rest of the group, um, Ron Carter, Joe Chambers, Don Friedman, Sam Rivers, and Attila Zoller. So uh, Max Polakoff ran this um, music in our time for town hall for an extended period of time. It was a contemporary music um, and where they interviewed the artists. Um, so there's a, so this, this recording um, has um, multiple composers performing their works. And so in the middle of it is, um, is this very brief interview with Joe Chambers and then um, the the piece? Uh, so it's uh, it was a, it was it was a surprise um, finding this. And again, one thing I you know what I really learned um, as listening to all these examples is that um, you know you find you find Attila Zoller working in all of these different situations. You find him working in straight ahead situations, uh, fusion situations. Um, free jazz situations and in every every arena that he works in um, you know the level of his playing is just so it's it it's so incredible for me that you know his he's incredibly versatile that in all these different genres of, of jazz he just he just fits in so so wonderfully so um, let's see I just cue this one up for you hold on The performers are already on stage. They are Ron Carter, bass, Don Friedman, piano, Sam Rivers, flute, Attila Zoller, guitar, and the composer Joe Chambers on drums. Here is Movement by Joe Chambers.
So now we we um, we get to the uh, we get to the cassette section, uh, and again, this was a it's really interesting going through uh, the, all of these materials. And then one of the things I've been trying to do is is to really you know know that these things really are these these things. So you find this tape that says Zinno in uh, eighty seven with John Hicks and Cecil McBee, um, and uh, Google you know, is a, is a useful, um, useful research tool. It's, uh, um, so I don't know who exactly has put New York Magazine um, into Google Books, but there's a, a big chunk of the 80s. Um, New York Magazine is in, um, in Google Books and you can find the entertainment listings in there. So sure enough, in the July 13th, 1987, uh, New York Magazine entertainment section, there it is. Um, you know, that's that's the actual concert. So, um, and we have this cassette that's been digitized. So let me cue this guy up, hold on a sec. And then the last one, the last one I'll play uh, tonight is from uh, all from nineteen from nineteen eighty seven as well, and this was a Vermont Jazz uh, Vermont Jazz Center guest concert. So uh, it's August. So my guess is that this is during the um, the August summer workshop in Putney, and they always have all the faculty do a uh, concert uh, with the faculty perform, and this particular one. Uh, the, one of the guests was um, the jazz guitarist, John Abercrombie. And so the example I'm going to play on this, there's a duet, of, it's My my Funny Valentine, the duet with John Abercrombie and Attila Zoller.
So there's just a few, um, there's just a few other things. Um, I have a little gallery of some other of the, uh, the tape covers just because some of them just are such incredible documents just as, as the, as giving context and, you know, just kind of like a sense of history or whatever. So I'm just show some of these. A lot of them have this kind of, I, I really like this kind of mid-century vibe, you know, with these strange abstractions or, you know, the um, odd kind of fonts and stuff like that. It just has this really kind of, And I, this was this is from from the '60s, I think, in Germany when he was doing some he was doing some soundtrack some soundtrack works uh, uh, in Germany at the time. And so this is, I think, from this this particular time. He worked with the uh, filmmaker um, Hans Jürgen Poland, who um, and Attila would do live jazz soundtracks. So he would like. Score, he had a score, but then the, the combo would actually do the soundtrack um, live. So it's pretty cool. All right, that's that's the end of that. John, I am I am amazed that the audio worked, um, <laughs> but I'm I'm even. But what I'm more delighted about is just I didn't realize we'd be treated to a to just a wonderful concert uh, and just enjoyed listening to to the music I, I out of curiosity is this the first time that you've shared these recordings I mean yourself or um yeah okay. actually yeah so, so, I, so, so it's a bit of a premiere then right is that yeah uh, yeah. yeah I've okay. been I have to say I've been I've been tardy and uh it's I don't know I maybe wonderful it, it could be this kind of like selfish kind of like you know you just keep it to yourself because it's so cool <laughs> yeah. but i've been really i've been tardy at making a, a thumb drive to, to the wow. team who have to listen to this stuff and I, when this is done i have to really get that done um but yeah it's it's um you know my wife gets to hear them um but otherwise yeah this is the first time other than other than carl who is the tech at the nedcc wow these are kind of like world. Sure. These are like world premieres for the. For so you didn't tell me you were going to premiere these things, then I would have <laughs> yeah, had more course, fanfare, sorry. you know. And, yeah. Oh my yeah, god! Sorry. So everyone, I so everyone here with us today <laughs> has witnessed. This is history. Okay, this is history. Um, uh, I should. Um, I, I know we have one question here, and I have a few for you. Um, yeah. So, but uh, um, our good friend Paul Carnahan has a question for you, and. He asks, do researchers come to Brattleboro to listen to these recordings or do you make them available electronically? I think you you answered that question by they're only for you and you don't share them with anybody, right? That's, that's <laughs> no, the, the plan is to actually have them online, um, probably using the aviary platform, uh, which is created by AVP. And they will, you know, I think people will, will probably need to sign up in other words you'll have to create an account and we're going to have to kind of vet the you know who the people are who are listening to them because there's a lot of copyright there's a lot of copyright work involved in making sure that we can provide uh these materials um the the easiest ones will be the uh, attila's compositions um you know it's it's other people's work that will from a copyright perspective will be more difficult but yes it will be available online although the jazz center does have plans of, of creating a facility for both listening to and um view and viewing the concert footage so so the, the archives itself is primarily digital at the moment or or, or sort of a, yeah so, yep. okay other than the other than the seven thousand CD collections, um, that's, that's another thing that you know. It's because again, some of those are uh, there are recordings that are, um, especially the avant-garde material, are, are quite are quite rare. The CDs are fairly rare. Hmm. So um, I had tons of questions I want to ask you, but I, I I'm maybe I guess that's you and Eugene see it. Um, I guess what are what do you foresee as your major challenges for I guess um, getting more people to know about this amazing collection. I mean, this this the Zola collection is one of many, right? And um, and 
I guess I, I know we had talked. You were you're setting the facility you're setting up and sort of challenges of storing some of the materials that you have. So, what you know, just out of curiosity, what what what's confronting you now in terms of setting up the archive? I guess that's the you know because I mean it's an archive and material, but actually the facility and all the functions of an archive because that's actually what Eugene has asked you to do is to come set up the archive. Right, right. So um, we just got a we just got a an, another space in the building uh, that we will you know do some treatments for climate um, air conditioner dehumidifier some stuff on the windows to reduce UV and stuff like that. So we actually did find a place to store the materials um, and we'll be able to control the be able to control the environment a bit. Um, the other you know the other. One of the challenges in a way is, um, you know, is, is cataloging the material just because it's all original material. Uh, so, oh, and then, okay. yeah. And yeah, you, that's, a, you, that's good, yeah. Yeah, you also have to remember um, that little, the box I showed you in the beginning, many of them, many, many of them do have boxes and many of them say things, but many of the boxes don't say enough things and some of them <laughs> are open reels. So, you know, when you have a 30 minute, open reel with no box, then the only way that you can evaluate that is, is listening to it. So, uh, you know, there's going to be, Gosh. yeah, there's going to be hours of listening to evaluate the material to know what's on them. Uh, let me follow up another question. I have a question that, uh, interesting question that Celia um, asked. Uh, would you talk about your training and how much of that assists with what you do now and how much has, has been learned on the job? Oh yeah, sure. I just, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> you just know everything, right? You didn't have any training. You just, you just showed up and said, I can do this, right? You know, well, I'm John Levine, I can do everything. Right? Yeah, I mean, before, <laughs> bef before, I, before I studied uh, library science, I was studying, you know, I studied electronic music and I was studying in the, I was in the mid eighties. So it was right at the cusp between analog and, and digital. And so most of my experience, uh, most of my experience was with the realm of working with tape. I mean, my own work that I, my own electronic work I was doing at the time, I was, I was used to working with tape. So, you know, the, so any of the sort of uh, intellectual challenges of understanding tape, <laughs> was kind of taken care of because I had already in my own professional or, you know, my, yeah, in my education and professional life, I had had to deal with, with, with tape. Um, and then, you know, the other, and then, and having studied, you know, um, music history when I was working on my MFA at the same time uh, was, was helpful as well. And then you know, we we go, we get to go back to talking about uh, you know talking about Mark again. Um, when I was, I was, in, I was yeah, yeah. yeah, when when I was in library school, you know, everyone thought Mark was on the way out, right? It was like Bib Frame was going to take care of it, or RDA was going to take care of it. So we, you know, we didn't we didn't like learn it. So I had to when, when we got Koha, I had to roll up my sleeves and uh, and figure it out. So you know, there's good documentation from OCLC and from Library of Congress and the historical, what is it? The Historical Society, Minnesota Historical Society and Middlebury has some good materials. And, you know, so you know, you, it's any place you go to school, one of the best things I think they can teach you to do is how to roll your sleeves up and teach yourself something how to do it, right? <laughs> so, no. um... I was going to ask you about PB Core, but I, I, we'll save that for another no, conversation. No, but I want to ask, actually, want to talk more about you, if you don't mind. Um, no, not at all. I think I think um, we we talked about this this weekend when I when we had a little chat, and I, I I know that you're a music aficionado. Um, so I'm, I'm going to sort of ask you kind of two sort of related questions. I guess are related. Um, you know. As a music aficionado, what is it to archive something you like? That's my first part of my question. The second part is, do you see, since you like this stuff so much, do you do you see yourself more as a curator than an archivist or, or an archivist, more as an archivist rather than a curator? 
um, vice versa. I don't know, just out of curiosity, because uh, we, 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 we talked about sort of having to be neutral and objective as archivists and, um, and uh, you know, dealing with materials, but what do you do when you like, you like it so much? You know, it's something you love. Let's see. So go ahead. I'm gonna, yeah. Um, I mean, there were when I started working on this, I really did start to be. I I did question, my, you know, am I really the right person to do this? Just you know, with my engagement with tape and, and you know, with the period of the mid '70s and free improvisation, you know, the whole nine yard is like, well, I can't really be objective about this because I'm like so into it, you know. But um, but the flip side is that the you know the other problem though, or not, is that the it's also this like Brattleboro, you know, there's tapes that were made in the Mole's Eye, which was this tavern that, you know, any musicians who's played in, anyone who's played in, in Brattleboro who's played in the Mole's Eye, you know, or driving by the old uh, Maple Valley thing that isn't Maple Valley any longer, you know? So it's like, so having the connection with Brattleboro is, you know, again, it's like, okay, I have, maybe I have too a connection to Brattleboro to like evaluate the material objectively or something, but it, it doesn't, it doesn't really matter. Um, you know, I think your enthusiasm and your your enthusiasm to have that great combination of knowledge and enthusiasm kind of rolled up in one. I'm I'm not going to worry about objectivity. I don't think. <laughs> yeah, I, I, but the second uh, half of the question, you, oh, sure. you know, yeah, um, and I really do think in this scenario, I think I do think of myself much more of as an archivist than a curator. You know. And partly it's because it wasn't like I was given, I wasn't given like seven, I wasn't like, I wasn't given seven boxes of tapes by seven different artists. And then saying like, well, okay, that box goes, that box gets digitized. And, you know, it was only one, it was only one collection. So in, in many ways, I don't feel like I'm, in this scenario, I don't feel like I'm curating because, you know, mm -hmm. it's just, it's just one collection. Uh, I'm not, I think of curating as, you know, you're deciding who's, if you think about it from the museum side, you know, you're deciding who's, 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 who's on the wall in the show. That's true. Yeah, that's, that's a different, different kind of intervention there. I'm going to yeah. ask you that question again next time. Maybe I'll ask you when I see you next, which is soon, right? Yeah. <laughs> you may, um, we have, another, we have I, another question in there. We got one more question before I have to, um, um, close our program tonight. Uh, Rachel asks that, uh, uh, how challenging do you think it will be to identify the music um, and the musicians on the mystery open reels? Will you crowdsource that? I, yeah, I don't think we're gonna crowdsource them. I mean, we're gonna use it or we're gonna use a local crowd. Uh, I think that there are there are people connected with the Jazz Center, um, board members and, and musicians and fans locally in Brattleboro that we can figure that out. Um, my own experience uh, with the material too, often the mystery tapes resolve themselves no. in, the, in the sense because, well, sometimes you're really lucky because they call out the musicians. Um, you know, like the, the Maple Valley, I had to listen to the whole tape and finally with my ear, like right next to the speaker, I could finally hear Attila say that it was Joe Chambers and Frank Luther, okay? It was finally mentioned there. Um, other times I think you're gonna know because of, uh, of the tunes themselves. And that, so within that context, you're gonna know that um, it's that tune from that, from that album. And so then you, you'll know who the people are, but there will be some other strange mysteries. Good. Yeah, I'm personally. I'm I'm excited to learn, hear more about the project as as things progress, and just the archives in general um, at at the center. So, uh, well, I should close the program because I promised to let you go at eight eight o'clock. And uh, thank you, John, for a wonderful program. I I just told I wasn't expecting to be premiering things but wow that was that was fantastic thank you and yeah, thank you everyone who oh go ahead yeah uh, I just want thank I just, you. For, for me the the last one you know that's like the that duet that that duet on um, my funny valentine with attila and john abercrombie is for me that's like there's you know there's no no dry no dry and what is it no no dry eye in the house for that way it's just like the it's 
anyway, it's, it's amazing. Yeah. Um, and uh, I, again, I hope you, I hope you take this on the road and let more people listen to it. Um, and not, not just keep it to yourself. <laughs> yeah. um, no, it's access. Uh, it's, it's all about access, right? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So uh, thank you everyone for joining us tonight. And I always felt this is the second one we did it. I, I finally kind of, it, it takes a, a few minutes for us to kind of get going. I feel like we could go another hour, but I, I, maybe, <laughs> maybe, maybe we'll do this again in another venue. Um, so uh, we have two other programs coming up um, next week. We have visual artist and curator, John Gittleson. He'll be talking to me about the influences of archives on this art, and that's scheduled for um, Wednesday, October 20th at 7 p.m. And then the following week, we have uh, Dan White, Daniel White, uh, who's an editor and the archivist for Florentine Films, that will be talking to us, um, uh, talking to me and to us. So, um, again, everyone, thank you very much. John, thank you. Wow, wow, wow. Um, and good night and farewell. Happy Archives Month.